several years. That's my favorite one. It is your get, favorite. We yeah. didn't get to do it last year. No. Well, I'd like to invite you to turn in your Bibles to Psalm 15 this morning as we continue in our series. We'll be looking at the 15th Psalm. Before we do that, let's pray. Father, we thank you for the truths that we can learn from this little message using pumpkins. We thank you to know that you have cleaned us on the inside. And it's through the power of your Holy Spirit and through the death of your Son, Jesus Christ, that we stand before you justified. Father, we pray as we look into your scripture now at this particular psalm that you'll again be our guide, be our teacher. Help us to understand the words, the meanings, the, the lessons that you have for us in this little psalm. We thank you now in Christ's name. Amen. Well, Psalm 15 is a, a wonderfully short psalm, and it asks and then answers one of the most penetrating questions, I think, in life. And that question is this. What are the conditions by which we may approach God? What are the conditions in which we can come then to God? We're told in the superscription here that it's a Psalm of David. He's the author. And if you remember anything about David, you'll recall that the scriptures say that he was a man after God's own heart. He's passionate. He was even emotional at times about knowing God. I think we can learn a, a lot from this particular psalm. So let's read it first, and then let's go back through and dig into it. Psalm 15. Lord, who may dwell in your sacred tent? Who may live on your holy mountain? the one whose walk is blameless, who does what is righteous, who speaks the truth from their heart, whose tongue utters no slander, who does no wrong to a neighbor and casts no slur on others, who despises a vile person but honors those who fear the Lord, who keeps an oath even when it hurts and does not change their mind who lends money to the poor without interest, who does not accept a bribe against the innocent. Whoever does these things will never be shaken. Now the psalm begins with a question. And the structure is very simple here. David asks this opening question, and then in verses 2 through 5, he's going to give a, a detailed answer to it. And so this first verse, I think is a, a beautiful example of the parallelism that we've talked about before in the book of Psalms and the poetry that, uh, that is used in the Hebrew literature. It, it looks at two separate questions, but I want you to understand that the intention is one idea here. So, he says, who may, who may dwell in your sacred tent? And then he follows it up, the parallel, who may live on your holy mountain? Now you look at those two ideas and think, sacred tent? Holy mountain? What in the world is David talking about here? Well, I think, in essence, it means God's presence. Of course, that holy tent is the tabernacle. The holy mountain would be Mount Zion. But when you put those ideas and contextualize them more for today, what David is saying is, so who can be in God's presence? Who can be your guest, Lord? Who do you approve of? Or 
what are the marks of a person who can come to you and be in your presence? Here's another way that I'd like to put it. How can I be comfortable in God's holy presence? Have you ever thought about it that way? How can I be comfortable in God's presence? So what does it take to be comfortable with God? I wonder this morning, are, are you comfortable with God? Are you comfortable with God when you're alone? Are you comfortable with God when you come in the presence of other people to this place that we call church? And that brings up the question of, well, why do you come anyway? Why would you come meet with other people? It all has to do with God's presence. I like Dr. D. James Kennedy. He was the longtime pastor at Coral Ridge Presbyterian Church down in Coral Ridge, Florida. He wrote this. Most people think of church as a drama with the pastor as the chief actor, God as the prompter, and the congregation as the critic. What is actually the case is that the congregation is the chief actor, the pastor is the prompter, and God is the critic. And when we come together as God's people, we want to be comfortable in his presence and we want to be able to be comfortable so that we can worship God. And he's the critic of what's going on in this hour or so. Now he asks this question, Lord, so who may dwell in your sacred tent? Who may live on your holy mountain? In other words, who can be comfortable in your presence? And now he's going to answer it. He's going to answer it with five basic answers. Very simple ones. The first one is in the first part of verse 2. The one whose walk is blameless, who does what is righteous. And so the first answer that David had, has is integrity and my lifestyle. So David begins to answer this question, and he's talking about our walk. In other words, it's all about integrity. That's the, the big picture that David wants to draw out here. Nobody can, or for that matter, should feel comfortable with God unless their walk in life has integrity. The Hebrew word here, which he uses, can be translated blameless or perfect or integrity. It also means straight or straightfulness. And I think that's why we often say he or she is like a straight as an arrow. That's the idea of integrity here. And so the condition that, that he has here is a condition of lifestyle. Now, he also uses the word blameless. Blameless, look, doesn't mean that you're perfect because nobody's perfect. We certainly know that. Only Jesus lived that perfect life, that life without sin. And so we cannot be perfect, at least in this mortal body, in this life, because of our sin nature. But we can seek to live our lives as morally acceptable as possible. And that's what David is talking about here. The parallel, notice here, is to do what's righteous. And that means seeking to do the right thing. Living a life uh, in which we're not ashamed of that life. And so this is the kind of person that, that God desires. This is the kind of person that can feel comfortable then with God. It's a person 
of integrity. Now, David goes on and he lists a, a, a second answer to his question of who can be comfortable. The second answer is found in the second part of verse 2, and then it goes on into verse 3. And the second condition that he tells us about has to do with our speech. In other words, it's integrity and my mouth. So godly people have truth in their hearts, and they speak the truth. He says, who speaks the truth from their heart? You know, most people like other people who speak the truth. It may hurt, may sting a little bit, but at least they know it's the truth. That's sometimes why we say to people, hey, can I tell you the truth about this? And we're kind of preparing them that we're not gonna sugarcoat it over, we're going to tell them the unvarnished truth, whatever that particular subject or topic is. Sometimes for this person, we talk about them as being a square shooter. If somebody says to you, well, so-and-so is a square shooter, what do they mean? Well, they mean they're gonna tell you the truth, whether you really wanna hear it or not. Lying is quite pervasive. It always has been. Lying is nothing new in the human race. Note that God, what God thinks about this kind of a person in Isaiah. So take your Bibles and move forward in the Old Testament to the book of Isaiah. A couple more books forward and find Isaiah chapter 29, for example. Isaiah 29, verse 13. Isaiah 29, 13. The Lord says, These people come near to me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. Their worship of me is based on merely human rules they have been taught. And as I, Isaiah writes the words of God there, what he's saying is that people often come before God and even their lips, their mouths, what they say is not true in their own worship. You see, David is not done here yet because he goes on in verse 3 and he says, whose tongue utters no slander, who does no wrong to a neighbor and casts no slur on others. And as he's building this idea of we need to have integrity with our speech, he's adding these thoughts about a person not uttering any kind of slander, especially toward a neighbor, who is not casting any kind of a slur out there on any other person. This means refusing to destroy other people with your words. You know, when I think today about social media, it seems that social media is the, the newest place to say things about other people that, frankly, you'll end up regretting and maybe needing to retract. I tend to see that all the time. That's the way social media is. It's so easy to just type in something because you've read something else or want to tell someone about someone else, and you type it in. It's like after you've pushed the send, it's out there forever. <laughs> And that's kind of hard to take that back, isn't it? You know, I've also read that in job interviews now, they are asking for all of your digital background and uh, they want to check a person's social media accounts. 
that prospective employer wants to see, what do you write about other people? <laughs> and I think that's a good thing, actually, because I think it tells them a lot about that person's character, about that person's integrity, if you will. And if they find that that person just can't control their own mouth, their own social media texts and what they write, that might not be a person that they necessarily want to hire. The basic idea here behind the word slander, by the way, means to go around. I love that. Slander means going around. And then secondarily, it had the meaning of to spy something out. When you slander someone, that's exactly what you're doing. You're spying them out, you're finding something, and you're not going to them, you're going around them with that information that you've gleaned. Slander is, is a very serious offense in God's eyes. Slanderous remarks can ruin a person's otherwise good character. It impugns their, their motives, their actions. Usually it involves some kinds of half-truths or maybe even outright lies. But what it does is it puts ideas in other people's heads that once they're put in there, they're always there. And so when you slander someone, say something about them to a, a third party, You've put that idea, you've planted that seed of an idea in their head, and now that idea might be there for a very, very long time so that when they see the person, and they think about that person, talk to them on the phone, whatever it is, that idea is in their head. Now let me stop here and draw out a little bit more application for us because I think this is so true of all of us in different ways that we wrongly use our speech. So let me give you five ways in which we do that, we wrongly use our mouths. First of all, by shading the truth. Now you know what that means. That means, well, I told the truth. But when you're really pressed about it, or you're given the fact of, no, this is what you actually wrote, you understand shading the truth. Because shading the truth is maybe not telling the whole story or telling all the truth, and you think, well, I told the truth, but the truth is, <laughs> you shaded the truth a little bit. Shading the truth. Number two, by having a constant, critical spirit with harsh words. That's using your speech the wrong way. I don't know about you, but I, I really get tired of people who constantly have that critical spirit. It's no fun being around those people. They find something wrong with everything. And it's much better to be around someone who's positive in their nature. They're not picking apart every person, everything, every event, whatever it is. And they're certainly not using them harsh words. Here's number three. I think we wrongly use our speech by gossiping about someone. And by the way, gossip is one of those words that we really need to better understand what the, what the idea or definition of gossip is. Yes, it's unwarranted communication, but here's the very best the definition that I've ever heard of what gossip is. And you can measure your words by this very, very quickly. Gossip is when you are not part of the problem or the solution. Isn't that good? That's what gossip is. So you know that you're gossiping if you're talking about someone else and you are neither part of the, 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 the problem or the solution. Now that brings up lots of other things that we'll talk about some other time about, well, why are you talking to the third party about that anyway? 
But if you're talking about someone else, and that's the case, then you can just mark it down. You're gossiping. Or number four, by using humor that's meant to put down or hurt someone else. And when you think about your humor, or the humor that you see on TV or with comedians or whatever it is, usually it's putting down, hurting someone else. Now, some comedians go through their routine and it's all about them. I did this and you laugh about that and they tell you funny stories about what they did. That's a little bit different, but think about it. It's still a put down, isn't it? And I think we wrongly use our speech when we turn it to humor that does those kinds of things. And here's the last one, by angry outbursts of temper. That certainly is the wrong use of our mouths. So David says, you want to feel comfortable with God? You want to be comfortable in God's presence? And you need to deal with your mouth. You need to have integrity with what you say. Here's the third one. This is in the first part of verse 4. It's integrity and my affections. Look at verse 4. Who despises a vile person, but honors those who fears the Lord. Now, at first glance, this attitude is totally hypocritical. Are we really supposed to despise a vile person? Are we really supposed to then honor a good person instead? And I think that David's point here is not to compare himself with other people to decide, well, who's evil and who's good. That's not the idea. I think his idea is this idea of affections. His idea has to do with loyalty, affection. His idea is being people of integrity means to hate what God hates, sin, and to love what God loves, believers who fear him. And so a person of integrity must have that kind of loyalty, that kind of affection, and those affections need to be in the right place. Here's number four. As David goes on in the second part of verse four, he says, who keeps an oath even when it hurts and does not change their mind. Do you want to be able to stand in God's presence and be comfortable with him? Then you gotta have integrity with regard to your commitments. That idea is an important indicator, I think, of integrity. It has to do with when you say something, that's exactly what you're going to do. You know, when as a Christian believer, you've made that promise, that vow, maybe it's a contract even, you've made that obligation, you of all people in the world should be the one to follow through on that. Even if you later find that maybe that was a little bit unwise or rash, yet you need to follow through. Even if it, it means costing you more money, more than you anticipated. I didn't mean for it to be like that, but you're gonna follow through on that contract, that promise, that obligation. You see, our word needs to be good. And people need to look at us in our dealings with them and say, oh no, his word is absolutely good. If he says that, if she says that, then it's good. You can count on their word. And so David says that that integrity has to do with our commitments as well. And then here's the last one, verse 5. 
who lends money to the poor without interest, who does not accept a bribe against the innocent. And so now finally, David touches on the real nerve of many people. You know what that is. It's money. Now you're meddling a little bit, David, because he brings up the, the practice of lending money. Now we need to understand that as we look at Scripture, all of Scripture, what it says about this. Because Scripture does not say you should never lend money. But there's a, a general principle about lending money at interest. And even that is not wrong. Because the Bible also talks about wise investing. And that's commended. Here's what Scripture condemns about lending money. It's the idea of exploitation. In other words, it means lending money at a rate in a way that takes advantage of another person's misfortune or their poverty or their circumstances. And that's why there's actually laws on the books against this thing that's called usury, the juice loan, the one that you can never possibly pay back because the interest is so high, you, you never pay down the principal. And as David looks at people and he thinks about money, he's coming to the conclusion that, that some people lend money to the poor and they do so with an interest rate that's so high that they'll never get out of debt. And so we need to have integrity with our money. Now, going hand in hand in that, he also talks about the exploitation of bribery or extortion. And look, we all know that's just plain wrong. <laughs> and I think David brings the, the subject of money into discussions because God is interested in seeing how we handle our money. You know, money is a great barometer of our integrity. Because you show me a person who's able to have money without loving money, and I'll show you a person with integrity. And so the fifth thing that, that David brings up here is integrity than with our money. Well, it's a very short psalm. It's a very simple psalm. And he's saying, well, how, how can I be in God's presence? And his answer is, well, there's a fivefold answer. Now, he ends the psalm with an answer to that original question. He says, so... He keeps saying, who? Who can do this? Who can do that? Whose? Who? Who? Did you notice that? All down, almost every verse, it says, who? And then he ends with this. Whoever does these things will never be shaken. So, who can be comfortable in God's holy presence? What are the conditions by which we can approach God? And his answer is, whoever does these things will never be shaken. Psalm 15. Let's pray. Lord, so many of these psalms are short, and yet their truth is so deep, so penetrating. We confess that it often cuts to the very heart of our own integrity. And I pray, Father, that today we might walk away thinking about these five areas in our life, five areas that David thought about apparently in his life. He wanted to stand in God's presence. He wanted to be comfortable with God. And then he thought about his life and how sin breaks in.
Father, I pray for each one of us this morning. Maybe there is one of these five that really convicted us that we need to deal with. And I pray if that's the case, that, that your Holy Spirit would work in their hearts, cleanse them of that sin as they confess it to you, so that they can again be comfortable with you in your presence. We thank you now in Christ's name. Would you please stand as we close our worship together? Take some time for donuts and refreshments and come back in the second one.